prepare for the removal and give them provisions. Almost unanimously, there was still opposition. The Cherokee people would not accept the help. They didn't want to leave. They wanted to stay where they were at. Um, and finally, finally, uh, let's see. They ceased their delay and started to accept some funds. Um, many traveled as individuals or families. There were several organized groups. So let's talk about that a little more. Before we talk about that, let's talk about how the Americans viewed the treatment of the Cherokee people. I think a lot of times we don't always look at the other side of it, and we tend to look at the immediate people who were mistreating the Cherokee. But actually, there were many, many Americans who were completely outraged by how the Cherokee were be being treated in that time. They said that the treaty of Nui Kota wasn't legal, which nowadays it w wouldn't be legal because there was a little renegade party, the Ridge Party, that formed it and made the deal with the government on behalf of the Cherokee Nation, and they weren't even recognized as Cherokee Nation government. So... Yeah, it, it wasn't super legal. And they called on the government not to force the Cherokees to move. The author, Ralph, Ralph <coughs> Waldo Emerson, even wrote a letter to the president, Martin Van Buren, who came after Jackson and um, completed the Cherokee removals, begging him not to inflict so vast an outrage upon the Cherokee nation. So, you know, there were, there were a lot of people trying to oppose it on both sides, Cherokees and the whites. <coughs> Excuse me. But it was just inevitable. It, it happened, you know, there was the deadline of May 23rd, 1838, was the deadline for them to voluntarily remove themselves. And they weren't getting it done. So President Van Buren assigned General Winifield Scott to head up the forced removal operation. I really like what little I've read about General Winfield Scott. He seemed like he had so much sympathy for the Cherokees, and I think he tried to be as kind to them as he possibly could. He arrived at New Dakota on May 17, 1838, just a few days before the deadline for them to get out on their own, and he commanded U.S. Army and state militia, which had about 7,000 soldiers with them. Scott said they better not mistreat any of the Native Americans. He ordered his troop to show every possible kindness to the Cherokee and to arrest any soldier who inflicted a wanton injury or insult on any Cherokee man, woman, or child. So they began rounding them up. They were removed at gunpoint from their homes, and this is when they were gathered in concentration camps, often with very few of their possessions. About a thousand. Okay, here's the number where some took refuge. A thousand took refuge in the mountains to the east, um, and some who owned private property escaped the evacuation. The Cherokee were then marched overland to departure points at Ross's Landing near Chattanooga, Tennessee, Gunter's Landing in Guntersville, Alabama, and on the Tennessee River. They were forced onto flatboats in the steamers Smelter and Little Rock. Unfortunately, the drought was so bad that year there were low water levels on the river. They had to frequently unload the vessels to evade obstacles. Um, the Army-directed removal was characterized by many deaths and desertions, and this part of the Cherokee removal proved to be a fiasco. And General Scott ordered suspension of further removal efforts. So General Scott suspended removal efforts. Cherokees remained in the camps, the internment camps, that whole summer of 1838. They had dysentery and other illnesses, which led to about 353 deaths. deaths. A group of Cherokee petitioned General Scott to hold off till the weather cooled. This was granted, and Chief Ross, who finally accepted defeat and realized they were going to be forced out, managed to have the remainder of the removal turned over to the supervision of the Cherokee government. There were some objections within the U.S. government because of the additional cost, but General Scott ignored it, which I liked this about General Scott. It says, even though there were objections from the U.S. government because of the cost, General Scott awarded a contract for removing the remaining 11,000 Cherokee under the supervision of Principal Ross 
with all the expenses of the removal paid by the United States Army, which outraged President Jackson and surprised many. So General Winfield made a decision on his own that defied the interest of the U.S. government and said, you know what, yes, you can move your people out and the United States Army will foot the bill and I don't care what the federal government says. And I liked that about him. So Chief John Ross let them out. He organized 12 wagon wagon trains, each with about a thousand people and conducted by veteran full blood tribal leaders, which is where Chief Going Snake would have come in because he led a group out or educated mixed bloods, which is also where the preacher um, Jones from the Baptist Mission Church would have come in because he also led a group out. So they, they left in some comfort. Lewis Ross, the chief's brother, he furnished forage rations and clothing for the wagon trains because remember they, they were wealthy. They had a lot of, a lot of money, a lot of things. And they even bought um, a couple of steamers. Oh, let's see where it says. Yeah, Chief Ross purchased the steamboat Victoria, which his own and tribal leaders families traveled in some comfort. So they actually didn't have as bad on the trail of tears as some of the rest. These detachments were forced to trek through various trails, crossing Kentucky, Illinois, Tennessee, Mississippi, Arkansas, and Missouri to their final destination of Oklahoma. Um, so let's talk about the aftermath. This is where Stan Wadey comes in. And I know this has been a long-winded route to get to San Wadey. And if you're still with me and you're watching, thanks. So the Cherokee people had been forced out. They were angry. One group who had it better and who was the cause of them being forced out, they felt like, because, you know, by nature, we always want to blame somebody and we want to be angry at somebody. And Really, they kind of had a right to be angry at the Ridge Party and Stan Wadey because they didn't want to be removed. They didn't want to form a treaty with the government. Stan Wadey's group did it anyway. Um, and it became the whole legal basis for them all getting removed. And it went against the will and what the church um, prepare for the removal and give them provisions.